Okay, how's that? I'm better without a stand anyway. So um, before we get started, just a little bit of administrivia. Uh, hi, my name is John. I am the Outreach and Communications Librarian here at the William H. Hannon Library. Um, on your seats, you have a feedback form. At some point between now and the end of the evening, I hope you will fill that out. It lets us know if we're doing a good job, if you like this type of programming, if we should do it again in the future, and we want to know what your experience was this evening. Also, uh, you'll notice that if you add your email, you'll be entered into a raffle for a $100 Amazon gift card at the end of the semester. And you can also sign up for our newsletter so you can find out about events like this one um, ahead of time before the room fills up and you can RSVP in advance. Uh, speaking of which, there's going to be a similar event to tonight on October 5th where the artist in residence, uh, Richard Turner, no relation to tonight's night speaker, uh, will be explaining and uh, describing the atrium exhibit uh, um, uh, and his sort of uh, collaboration with Paul Harris for that. So that's on October 5th, and if you sign up for the newsletter, you'll get advance notice about the RSVP. So um, anyway, uh, tonight the schedule is going to be uh, pretty simple. Uh, we're going to have an introduction by our deans, uh, the dean of the library, Chris Francolini, and the dean of Bellarmine, Robin Crabtree. Uh, then Paul Harris is going to introduce tonight's featured speaker, who will then speak and have a Q&A afterwards. And then after that, we will progress into the reception, where you'll get a chance to explore the Archives and Special Collections exhibit um, in our gallery. So, without further ado, I want to introduce you to the Dean of the William H. Hannon Library, Chris Franklin. Thank So, um, as John said, I'm Chris Franklini. I'm the Dean of the William H. Hannon Library. I have such a loud voice, I don't even know I talk in this. Um, we're really pleased to welcome you here this evening. I believe that tonight's event, gala event, has been in the works for at least a year and probably longer. Probably more like multiple years, right Paul? I think so. So, I'm pleased to welcome you all to the William H. Hannon Library. Tonight's gala celebration uh, marks the opening, the official opening of the Bellarmine Forum, celebrating the values of time, and the Library's Fall Exhibition, So Short a Lease, Early Reflections on the Human Timeline, curated by graduate student Myra Cortez through an internship program collaboratively developed between the Department of English and the Library's Department of Archives and Special Collections. Myra is here with us tonight. I'd just like to point her out to right over there. Wave to the audience, Myra. The exhibition, which as you heard, will be open after tonight's presentation. Um, there will be food out there, and of course you may not take your food or drinks into the exhibition space, but we welcome you to tour the exhibition. The exhibition features images and text from our collections that engaged readers in, the early, mo in early modern Europe, illuminating how people viewed time in relation to life, death, and faith. Major emphasis on death. Uh, kind of grim, we do have a grim reaper in there, actually more than one. Uh, alongside these early works, the exhibition acknowledges the contributions of J.T. Fraser to the advancement of scholarly dialogue related to all aspects of time, featuring materials from the library's collection, J.T. Fraser personal papers, and materials from the International Society for the Study of Time collection. The exhibition gallery, again, will be open after this evening's presentation, and it will be up through December 16th, approximately, so that if, you, uh, if it's just crowded or you're pressed for time, please come back another time and, and uh, take advantage of the exhibition. It's beautiful. So next, I would like to introduce Robin Crabtree, Dean of the Bellarmine College of Liberal Arts, who will introduce the Bellarmine Forum. Robin. so lovely to finally be here. <laughs> it seems like we have been traveling to this moment for a very long time. And this is for a few reasons. Uh, not the least of which uh, the intellectual conversation between Brad and Paul, which is many long years that have uh, imagined uh, this series of events will have for the Bellarmine Forum. Uh, I want to say a few words about the Bellarmine Forum as a um, endowed program in the Bellarmine College of Liberal Arts and at Loyola Marymount University. 
that seeks to support innovative teaching, curriculum development, and public programming, all around cultivating appreciation for the liberal arts, for the Jesuit educational mission, and uh, not only at the university, but uh, in the community at large. Um, a lot of guiding principles uh, inform faculty imagining of the annual Bellarmine Forum. And some of these are the desire to create activities, uh, courses that are associated with those activities that reflect and advance uh, our, our college emphasis on academic excellence, global and local citizenship, interdisciplinarity, um, and or interfaith dialogue. And I think uh, this particular Bellarmine Forum touches those bases. Um, we hope that the programming we produce through the Bellarmine Forum will have broad intellectual interests uh, on campus and off, <coughs> support team teaching, engage students meaningfully in the classroom and beyond it, um, and uh, manifest the Ignatian values for holism, for uh, hospitality, uh, for artistic and creative expression in addition to um, some of our more um, our departments and programs in the humanities and social sciences. And again, this Bellarmine Forum uh, touches all of those bases. Uh, just what can we say about uh, <laughs> professors Paul Harris and Brad Stone in the time allotted? <laughs> uh, just that they blow my mind and they seek to blow all of our minds with this year's Bellarmine Forum. So let's commence. <laughs> Thank you to both Chris and uh, Robin for those wonderful introductory remarks. And uh, I am going to speak, in the interest of time, I'm going to speak for both Brad and I. But I do want to say what a joy it is and how absolutely shared an adventure this is between Brad and I. And so I would like a round of applause for Brad. <laughs> Brad and I have had wonderful intellectual conversations and uh, exchanged our writings, and we've taught what we call guerrilla graduate seminars together, where we just got groups of interested students together to read and uh, write things. And um, it's in that rediscovery of that spirit that we reboot and rediscover the Bellarmine Forum. And just very briefly, the forum this fall is comprised of four courses being taught around the theme of the values of time. There is a course by Sue Scheibler in the film school. There's a Buddhism course by Chris Chappell. There's a first year seminar on art and power and the introduction of aesthetic time in the 19th century by Amy Woodson Bolton in history. And Brad and I are co-teaching a cross-listed course in philosophy and English just called the values of time. And that is the wonderful thing that's happening. A group of faculty and students teaching, researching, and writing about a common theme in a collaborative, truly collaborative kind of way. And it's an interdisciplinary adventure. And uh, Brad brilliantly frames the Bellarmine Forum as a true forum, an open space through which people pass and interact and exchange ideas and goods and uh, make bargains for future <laughs> endeavors and uh, we hope that that spirit catches and when I was explaining to uh, our speaker Fred Turner uh, the spirit of interdisciplinary education and everything that we're talking every interdisciplinary collaboration doing things across disciplines having students encounter this kind of work he said oh there's an old word for that education. <laughs> so it feels like that's what we're doing. And part of that is uh, what we simply call slow LMU. And it's a plea not to do less, but to do more attentively each thing that we do. And in the spirit of play and experimentation, that's a crucial part of the ethos of the Bellarmine Forum. 
we've uh, installed what we call slow time zones. And so the beautiful exhibition that Myra and Cynthia have mounted, which is the featured exhibition for tonight, is such a slow time zone. And the slow time zones invite you to aesthetic experience and pleasure, intellectual stimulation. They also provoke deeper religious or spiritual questions. The exhibition that is also out here that John referred to uh, in relation to the common book, the exhibition called Being in Slow Time. There are materials around the third floor. That's also a slow time zone. Uh, soon there will be a labyrinth to walk on the bluff overlooking the city and the ocean. And there's also something called the Displacement Garden next to the LeBand Art Gallery where you can go contemplate a minimalist Zen garden and stacked stones. So the spirit of the forum is both the intellectual collaborative adventure and also the experiential regrounding in the campus. And the pleasure of doing this work, I think, for both Brad and I has been the regrouping and reconnecting with so many people. So I just really want to thank again Chris and John and Carol Ravy and Cynthia and Myra for their work in the library and the hospitality that they extended, all the values that Robin enumerated have been part of that experience. So we have this beautiful thing going which reminds us of why we wanted to be in a university in the first place <laughs> and why the university campus and the library are two of the great things that humans ever have collectively invented and occupied. <laughs> so that is my segue to the International Society for the Study of Time, which is being celebrated also in the exhibition and this evening. So the International Society for the Study of Time is marking its 50th birthday this year. And it was founded and created by J.T. Fraser, Julius as I will refer to him. And uh, as Chris mentioned, the archive of the society is uh, in fact in special collections here. So it's wonderful to celebrate uh, that spirit. The ISST, as it's called, the International Society for the Study of Time, Julius's brainchild was each three years, we have a week-long conference where we live and talk and work together, and the conversations end up producing a publication. So there is something called the Study of Time series. We're now at volume 16, and it's an archive of interdisciplinary uh, research, thinking, and creativity. So it's wonderful to celebrate uh, that society and that work on an occasion like this. And uh, Fred Turner in his memoriam essay, uh, When Julius Fraser Passed, said J.T. Fraser was the most important philosopher of the 20th century. And I feel like that's not only true, but it's actually now that his work is more readable and appreciated. And that is because he formulated an integrated theory of time that brought together the natural sciences and the humanities. And he had a cosmic and a ethical, political vision of time together. And that is the great challenge of what we are trying to think now in the wake of uh, the state of the world, the state of the globe, and so on. So uh, what I found so inspiring from uh, reading Julius's work was here is someone who has formulated a theory, a grand theory of everything, and then it's a tool that he uses to think through other questions. He, can, he would take any question or issue and run it through his theory. A big part of the success and endurance of the society is Julius's uh, wife of many years and now widow Jane Fraser. And it is a great, great pleasure and honor to have Jane with us this evening. And uh, <laughs> I'm going to say a word of 
and also Julius' son, Tom, is also here. So it's a great honor and pleasure. And Jane and Julius traveled the world having conversation with people and drawing the life of the society uh, forward and inspiring us and uh, really in the Ignatian spirit of engaging the whole person and the spirit of lifelong learning. And uh, Jane, I'm just, I'm not going to share the contents of this gift, but I do have something for you, which my wife Anita pointed out is what Julius used to do. <laughs> Julius marked our wedding by giving us the Julian calendar date and a series of quotations about time and love. <laughs> that if I tried to read it to you now, I'll just start weeping, literally. <laughs> but it was like he gave you time. Mm -hmm. So I tried to devise a little bit of time in a box for you, and I'm just going to hand this to you. But please come up and receive this. Jane. <laughs> Jane claims to have been successfully embarrassed, which warms my heart. <laughs> so, with that, we will turn to uh, this evening's talk. This evening's speaker is Professor Frederick Turner from the University of Texas at Dallas. He is also a long, long-standing member of the International Society for the Study of Time. And uh, in the wake of Julius's passing, you are our senior guru. <laughs> Uh, time. of time. Fred is the kind of brilliant mind that when I encountered him as a graduate student just set me on fire. And anyone who has conversation uh, with Fred for any amount of time has that experience and I just saw a couple of nods from colleagues who just had that experience here. Fred is the author of over 30 books of poetry, criticism, translations of poetry. His work has been translated around the world. He is the author of two epic poems in iambic pentameter of precisely 10,000 lines. One is called Genesis, and his new just coming out book is called Apocalypse. So he can sort of tell you the whole story of time. <laughs> and his work as a poet and a scholar integrates the arts and humanities in a truly visionary way that speaks to, it's the role of the poet as a prophet, as a historian, as someone who surveys the world. It's poetry for everyone, of everyone. And this evening he will give us uh, some meditations on time and Shakespeare, which is a subject about which he's written two books, and I'm sure more to come. So with that, it's a great pleasure to have Fred Turner. You guys are so lucky to have Paul. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, can everybody hear me? Good. Just a couple of uh, rooms away, there's, uh, there's that wonderful exhibit of the emblems, the, the, uh, the, the woodcuts and the etchings and so on. Um, now, in Shakespeare's late play, The Winter's Tale, there's a rather strange speech that is uttered by an emblematic figure. So you've got an emblem that is put on stage. Eminently explaining to the audience that 16 years are now about to pass before the story resumes. An arrant breach of Aristotle's recipe for a good play. That it preserves the unity of time and ideally should not represent more than a day of action. Shoddy workmanship. <laughs> or an opening to something very remarkable indeed. A deeper understanding of the biggest philosophical mystery of all, the nature of time. You be the judge. Let me recite it, then try to unpack it for you. 
I that please some try all, both joy and terror of good and bad, that makes and unfolds error, now take upon me in the name of time to use my wings. Impute it not a crime to me or my swift passage that I slide o'er sixteen years and leave the growth untried of that wide gap since it is in my power to o'erthrow law and in one self-born hour to plant and o'erwhelm custom. Let me pass the same I am, ere ancient's order was, or what is now received. I witness to the times that brought them in, so shall I do to the freshest things now reigning, and make stale the glistering of this present, as my tale now seems to it. Your patience disallowing, I turn my glass, and give my scene such growing as you have slept between. Leontes leaving, the effects of his fond jealousies so grieving that he shuts up himself, imagine me, gentle spectators, that I now may be in fair Bohemia, and remember well, I mentioned it, son of the kings, which Florizel I now name to you, and with speed so pace to speak of Perdita, now grown in grace, equal with wandering. What of her ensues, I list not prophecy, but let time's news be known when tis brought forth. A shepherd's daughter, and what to her adheres which follows after, is the argument of time. Of this allow, if ever you have spent time worse ere now, if never, yet that time himself doth say, he wishes earnestly you may never may, you never may. Well, I that please some try all. The Winter's Tale was first performed in 1611. Shakespeare is 46 years old, having just celebrated his birthday. Pretty old for an Elizabethan, he only has six more years to live. But astoundingly young for someone who has written the funniest comedies in the world, the most radically thoughtful action-packed historical dramas, and then the tragedies which have forever changed the nature of literary and dramatic art. What can he do for an encore? What can one say after Hamlet, King Lear, Othello, and Macbeth? Should an old man just quit while he is ahead? Well, no. Shakespeare sets out to explore new territory, which is, in a sense, old territory for him, arriving where he started and knowing the place for the first time. He goes back to the powerful women he created in the romantic comedies and wonders how they'd do in a truly tragic situation. The Winter's Tale is the first truly feminist work of dramatic fiction in the Western tradition, perhaps in the world. Even Antigone and Lysistrata basically accept the wisdom of what we rather inaccurately call the patriarchy. The Winter's Tale ends with the moral government of the world in the hands of a woman, the wise Paulina. She is a female St. Paul who has punished the King Leontes for 16 years for suspecting his wife Hermione of infidelity, destroying his children by her and driving her to death. The play really gets going after the horrible tragedy has taken place, a tragedy summarizing all the major themes of the four great tragedies before it. The wasteland sprouts forth the flowers of spring. And this capacity for growth and new things, even after the Holocaust, is characterized by Shakespeare as the work of women, a weaving rather than a vengeful cutting. Paulina's great ally is time itself. Tragic destruction can happen very quickly, but growth takes time. And this play is very much about the growth of babies in the womb, of children into adults, the flowers of spring, the pastoral care of a growing flock of animals, and the slow nurturing of insight. There's a long-standing theatrical tradition, which I accept as correct, that the part of time was played by Shakespeare himself. So it's William 
the storyteller himself who comes onto the stage in the outdated style of a chorus, wearing and carrying the outdated medieval emblems of time. His speech, directly and explicitly to the audience, begins with I, breaking the fourth wall, and by implication, identifying time with subjective identity <coughs> itself. He is, as he says, rather modestly, one who pleases some but not others, the great dramatist of the time, but rather past his prime now among rivals like Johnson and Webster. His own self-awareness, his implied inventory of his past, is itself a core characteristic of time. Even physical events we know now are based on what physicists call the memory function, the being of a physical object even one as small as a particle, is a kind of ad hoc summary or recollection of its previous history. As time, in the person or mask of time, Shakespeare, as, as time, in the person or mask of time, Shakespeare claims that he tries all. That is, he subjects by his art all things to a destructive testing, a trying, like that of an accused prisoner, a freshly tempered blade, or rising loaf of raw bread dough. Or simply, he tries things out, he experiments, he sees what works, like the evolutionary process so familiar to Shakespeare's contemporaries, who are all well aware of the way dogs, horses, roses, apples, and all manner of living things could change through trial and error adaptation or selective domestication. Certainly Shakespeare didn't use the word evolve and mightn't have generalized, generalized selective adaptation to the history of life on this planet. But it's the same paradigm as Darwin's 250 years later. From fairest creatures we desire increase, that thereby beauty's rose might never die, he says, in the first line of the first of his sonnets, setting the evolutionary theme of all of his works. Shakespeare's words are so arranged that both the dramatist and time are appropriate speakers of them. So you can, you can take what time is saying, either as what time is saying, or what Shakespeare is saying. Either please some, try all. Perhaps consciousness itself is the concentrated cumulative essence of all those transformative processes that lumped together we call time. So let's explore this idea with Shakespeare's help. I that please some try all, both joy and terror of good and bad that makes and unfolds error. Is there a grammatical error here? I makes and unfolds error? It only works if what makes and unfolds error is all, the only singular third person noun in the place. I try all that makes and unfolds error. All being the joy and terror of goodness and badness, or the joy and terror of good and bad persons. The badness and goodness of bad and good people make error. They also unfold it, that is, they deploy it, they make it effective. But they also reveal it, they make it become apparent and known. The past is folded up in itself and moral action unfolds it so that it can enrich the present, either by revealing evil and so rectifying injustice, or by allowing good creative seeds to finally come to fruit. By the way, unfold is a pretty good Anglo-Saxon translation of the Latinate word evolve. And an error is not just a mistake, but a maze. One of the words, uh, the, the old word for a maze was an error. A folded up piece of subjective space. Or a wandering and uncertain path of discovery, as in the journey or quest or errand of a knight errant. <laughs> now take upon me in the name of time to use my wings. Winged time. Time flies. 
Shakespeare makes his audience smile at the artificial wings he is wearing as a live emblem or pageant figure. You can see some of those emblems with time with his wings and so on, a big beard and, and his hourglass. Um, well, uh, here is Shakespeare. The drama has become much more sophisticated by then. I mean, it's as if, you know, in a contemporary piece of, uh, you, you know, uh, um, a move, an action drama movie, um, somebody comes in in the middle of it, so in black and white with, with subtitles, you know. <laughs> that it's, that there's, there's an anachronism going there. Um, and Shakespeare's sort of making fun of himself. He's taken up them on the the artificial wings and the and the, and the, the paraphernalia, as he takes upon himself his poetic task and artistic privilege, turning the conventional cliche into a strangely striking surreal piece of theatre. The revered contemporary author in pantomime costume. It's a Pierre Menard moment. If there are any lovers of Jorge Luis Borges in here. The idea, though, is philosophically problematic. Use my wings. Something, like a bird or an arrow, flies in time. It travels so many furlongs of space in so many seconds or minutes of time. But if time itself flies, that means that it's flying is flying. And what does that mean? If flight flies, then it has fled, and it's not flying anymore. The quality or capacity of flight has departed. Wouldn't the flying of its flying also be flying? Is time the river or the banks of the river? Or is it both? Or are the banks flowing too? Or is the paradox not a problem in the, descrip not a problem in the description of time, but the essence of time? Later time will say, let me pass the same I am. Time is consistent in its inconsistency. The recursiveness of any description of it is a truth about it. The past is past change, but it does not change despite the spin-doctoring of tyrants, news analysts, and historians. Time is precisely the interface of passage, passing, with remaining, being. And here it comes. Impute it not a crime to me or my swift passage, that I slide o'er sixteen years and leave the growth untried of that wide gap. Time slides over sixteen years of what? Time. <laughs> it slides over itself. Or is it that the human consciousness of the passing of time and the human memory of past time, themselves temporal, time-based, since it takes time to remember and to do, can slide over more primitive, fixed, frozen stretches of the same material. Is what we call years the same stuff as the time we subjective ex ex subjectively experience as passing, except not blessed with the capacity to reflexively and recursively transcend itself, to time travel as we do when we remember, or anticipating the future, act to make it happen. There's a good way of time traveling into the future, which is by doing something. <laughs> and there's a good way of time traveling into the past by remembering. You know, we're, we're, we're time machines. In medieval logic, the kind of infinite regress that we got into just now, of flying time, flying, 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 would be considered a logical crime. But time and Shakespeare both insist in the same voice that it's not a crime of logic or of anything else. Or at least it's not a crime that should be imputed as such to Shakespeare, or to time, or to time's swift, swift passage. And he, time, Shakespeare, is not going to put it on trial. He leaves the growth of that wide gap untried. The gap grew, but the gap also contained all sorts of growth. The growth of the abandoned royal baby into a woman, the growth of Leontes' understanding of his dead wife, the growth of love between his daughter and his alienated friends and falsely suspected cook old splendid young prince. Growth must have room to grow, and that room is time. Time slides over it in this reflective passage. To slide is to forego the effort and damage and wear and tear of actually walking or plodding through it. 
encountering resistance with every step as we do when we experience time directly, there's no resistance to this new kind of time that came into being, perhaps, with human consciousness and memory. The logical crime may actually not be a crime at all, but the very source of growth, emergence, healing, an affordance, a loophole or secret entrance that permits new things to happen even after the most appalling tragedy. At the end of King Lear, Kent, the old king's friend, asks, is this the promised end? Is this doomsday? Says Kent. The Winter's Tale answers that question. When the old shepherd finds the abandoned royal baby on the seashore, he tells his son, who has just seen the ship go down with all hands in the storm, Thou mettest with things dying, I with things newborn. And he prefixes this with the words, Now bless thyself. Since it is in my power to earth throw law, and in one self-born hour to plant and overwhelm custom, Crimes belong to legal systems and to moral customs. Without rules and prohibitions, there are no infractions. Time, Shakespeare, here claims that those legal systems and customs are themselves subject to time. Events and actions don't just happen on a foreordained timeline based on eternal laws that serve as the evaluators of the goodness or badness of the events. Instead, the laws and customs themselves are changed by time in a self-born hour that is its own parent and determinant. Here, Shakespeare anticipates the speculations of some contemporary cosmologists, such as Andre Linder, Max Tegmark, Brian Greene, and others, who now suggest that the very laws of physics themselves, perhaps even the laws of logic and mathematics, might have come into being by an evolutionary process. In the quantum universe of the Big Bang, the laws of classical physics did not yet exist. Indeed, the identity law of Aristotle, P is P, P is not not P. The foundation of syllogistic logic did not apply. A photon is a thing and not a process, but it is also a process and not a thing. And in the Big Bang, photons were all that existed. The universe then fell into our particular set of rules and could have fallen into other, other ones and there may be an infinitude of other universes with different rules. The universe didn't evolve within a set of existing rules, but invented rules to grow in. Time, according to this view, is not just the changeless t-axis or measuring stick of a graph. The axis is changed by the events it measures. The events are the time. Time is creative, but it is a creativity that opens things up and allows rather than limits, determines, or enforces. Time is asymmetrical. We cannot predict something before it happens, but we can retrodict it with perfect accuracy, possibly, or near perfect accuracy, afterwards. Though time, says Shakespeare, in the voice of time, can overthrow law, we, you know, we can't remember the future. Though time, says Shakespeare, in the voice of time, can overthrow law and overwhelm custom, Time is not an, a revolutionary criminal or a traitor. Time makes the rules and customs and fashions he later rescinds and, and repeals, because, as we say, he can. He who has the power to mint the coinage of the realm is not a counterfeiter. Notice that the, images he, the image he uses for the establishment of a new law or custom is plant. Time is a gardener, not a tyrant. Even if he often pulls up the weeds and acts as a destructive overthrower or overwhelmer of any obstacle to new growth. But in taking this view, Shakespeare has changed his own mind profoundly about the nature of time. In the sonnets, mostly written in his youth, time is a tyrant, a devourer, a jailer, a merciless creditor, a cruel landlord. Now, paradoxically, as he nears his own death, when, from the current pulpit of his times, we are called to the final audit and tribunal, time seems to him to be a liberator, a giver of life. And that creative process, revolutionary as it is, has its own strange stability. Creative change itself is the same process, whether in the earliest stages of the world's emergence or in the novelties that burst on the scene in every contemporary hour. 
let me pass the same I am ere ancient's order was or what is now received. I witness to the times that brought them in, so shall I do to the freshest things now reigning, and make stale the glistering this present, as my tale now seems to it. The very poetry of this speech, what is now received, is the same productive flow that created the plants and animals and the human race itself. Evolution is slow poetry, poetry is fast evolution. Time witnesses, and here we're back to the trial scene of the first line of the speech, not only actions, but the times that bred the rules that judge those actions good or bad. Maybe the freshest things now reigning, our wonderful avant-garde with all of its contempt for old ideas, will soon itself be quaint, stale, and even ludicrous. All that glitters is not gold. The present is a lovely gift, present gift. But if we try to hang on to it and make it the rule for the future, it will lose its creative freshness and become the tyrant it opposed. The tale, the story of the play so far, with its profound understanding of tragedy, its masterful grasp of the latest psychological trends in drama and moral philosophy, is suddenly, from this point of view, outdated by a new perspective. But the new perspective is itself found in the dusty photograph album and headed for it in turn. It's not the latest fashion that is real, but the creative opening to growth that produced the fashion. Shakespeare time is not a follower of fashion. Choruses went out years ago, but a reliably continuing source of fat fashion. Your patience is allowing. I turn my glass and give my scene such growing as you had slept between. The past is not dead. It goes on growing underneath. The glass in this image is the hourglass, one of the traditional properties of the emblem of time, as you see in the emblems uh, next door. At the end of the hour, the time measurer must turn the, the hourglass upside down, literally a revolution or half of one, must turn things topsy-turvy. But paradoxically, this change or reversal actually allows the sand of the past, the old sand that we had discarded into the drain or dustbin of history, to flow back through the bottleneck of the present. Shakespeare was living at a unique moment in human history when, in the Renaissance, the rebirth, a whole continent dedicated itself to resurrect, uh, to resurrect a past era of history, an era more than 1,600 years before the time of the classical Greeks and Romans, and also the time of the historical Jesus, whom both Protestants and Catholics were striving to rescue from the past. Atomism was rediscovered. Greek mathematics was recovered from the Arabs. Opera was invented as an, in an attempt to restore the Greek mu musical drama. Architecture abandoned what had been the brilliant modernism of late, of late Gothic and built things with pillars and architraves that were a scandal, an outrage, a re reactionary betrayal of the present. Painting and sculpture went back to the pagan worship of the actual human body. At the end of The Winter's Tale, a sculpture of this kind will be taken to be a real, live human. And indeed it is. We can go back, we can go back to the past, and maybe we should, but it will have changed and grown in the meantime. So what now in the present flows, what now in the present flows through the bottleneck of that glass is the stuff of the past, reordered surely, but not lost at all. Time, Shakespeare, gives his scene such growing that all those years, or even centuries, seem like a dream from which we have just awoken, astonished that we were here all along. I once awoke from a dream in which I had lost my home and yearned to be back in my familiar bedroom. With huge relief and comfort, I recognized the walls that I had painted and saw the curtain across the window move with the slight breeze coming through the partly open sash. And then I really awoke. The first awakening had been just a dream. I really was a thousand miles away from that beloved home, which no longer belonged to me. The grief was for a moment unbearable. But on reflection, I realized that I still possessed that house if I could feel such happiness and exact recognition of it. When I awoke, I had turned the glass. The hourglass is a key feature of the nautical age of sail. One of the great innovations of the Renaissance, which paradoxically coexisted with its staggeringly reactionary nostalgia for classical times, 
was the birth of modern navigation. The new world, which Shakespeare will visit in his next play, The Tempest, was only discovered with the help of that same projective geometry with which Renaissance artists represented perspective space. Navigators had already learned to establish latitude, distance from the poles, in the open sea. But without a good measure of time, we could not establish longitude, how far east or west we are from our own port. The keeping of time was essential, or the ship would be wrecked, like the ship bearing the baby princess and the ship of the Neapolitan nobles in the tempest. So the nautical glass became an essential instrument for finding one's way and not getting lost. Indeed, the word glass was the nautical term for an hour of time. Turn the glass and strike the bell was the immemorial chant of the Royal Navy for hundreds of years. And bell was another word for the time of day. Six bells, Captain. So navigating time is like navigating a ship of exploration at sea, using time to conquer time, as T.S. Eliot put it in Four Cortez. Shakespeare time now reminds us of the story so far, literally reliving briefly the previous three acts. The aunties has been grieving and repenting, Hermione is dead, as is his little son Mamilius, his daughter Perdita, the lost one, has been brought up by shepherds. But he is not going to give spoilers, and neither does reality. He turns now to speak of Perdita, now grown in grace, equal with wondering, what of her ensues, I list not prophecy, but let time's news be known when it is brought forth. Grace and wonder two of Shakespeare's most powerful words of blessedness, especially in these last plays where he steps beyond all the literature of the past. And what is lost is now going to be found, for Leontes will be led by Paulina with his now-discovered daughter Perdita into a mystic gallery where stands a work of Renaissance art, a sculpture of his dead wife, Hermione. Strangely, it is sculpted as if she had aged, and it is almost terrifyingly realistic. The aunties will take her hand and exclaim, oh, she's warm. And Shakespeare will have fooled us all. She was not dead after all. The image seems to be an enormous artistic claim that the past is not dead, that it has been here all along, though changed indeed. Some of our contemporary physicists now maintain that information cannot be destroyed, though it can be created. How much time do I have? Okay, good. <laughs> that um, information cannot be destroyed, although it can be created, and that information is the basic substance of physical reality. Information, they say, is what everything is made of, not matter, not even energy, but information. And when information falls in its medium of matter onto the surface or singularity of a black hole, as its speed approaches that of light, it becomes as timeless as light. Or to put it another way, as its speed increases, its time relativistically slows down to a dead stop, and it is preserved as long as the black hole exists on that surface below which there is no return. This is Stephen Hawking. So everything we have ever been, all of our pasts, and all of our ancestors' pasts, are either flying in the form of light waves through space, or being preserved forever on those black hole boundaries of the universe of physics. It is for us to remember, to imaginatively outpace that explosion of the present into light, and give it back its limbs, its members, and its reality. So I come back to my first work of scholarship exactly 50 years ago, and mine deeper into the same material, the speech of time and the winter's tale that was at the core of my Oxford dissertation. And I do it the summer my mother died. And so this work may be redemptive for me in my present state of loss and darkness. Fifty years ago, fifty light years away, the packet of light waves encoding everything I was at that time is still plunging outwards into the cosmos. Two trillion miles away, out in the Oort cloud, my mother's last conscious present is sailing away from me in pursuit. Maybe the statue can come to life, though changed into something rich and strange. 
Maybe there will be a new birth of Shakespeare's scholarship and criticism, a new kind of writing about literature, a new birth of literature in the question, what is literature for, and the answer that it is for the resurrection of the past, a Jurassic Park of beauty and meaning. Of this allow, if ever you have spent time worse ere now, if never, yet that time himself doth say, he wishes earnestly you never may. and eloquence of thought are capable of producing something truly beautiful, which is exhilarating. <laughs> and you are exhausted and don't want it to stop at the same time. That was truly stunning and beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for the assignment. You, know, and you give people assignments that change their lives. <laughs> well, let's, uh, we have time for questions. Yeah. I'll moderate a discussion. The floor is open for questions. Mm -hmm. Theresia, get us started, yeah. please. Wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the link of the time in that play to the, to the growing up of two children. I mean, you started to talk about it a little bit, but this idea that it, it takes precisely as long uh, for those two children to be able to be married, right? Yes. From beginning to end. Yeah. As it takes to slide over that time. I wondered if you had something to say about that. Yeah. Um, in, in, the old, uh, in the old folk tales, um, if you go down into the underworld, if you go, if you go to the world of the fairies, you go to fairyland, Often under the hill, um, uh, you might spend seven days there, but you come back seven years later, or you spend a year there and come back a hundred year, hundred years later. And what does fairyland mean? Fairyland, I think, means this strange time travel power that we have. That is. Um, well, in the tale of True Thomas, uh, Thomas the Rhymer, it's one of the, the great Scottish border ballads. Thomas is, uh, sit, is sitting under a, an oak tree at a crossroads, and it's always dangerous to, uh, crossroads are always dangerous. <laughs> and this most unbelievably beautiful woman comes r riding by on a white horse with jingling bells. And he, he, he's, he goes down on his knee, and he, he says, uh, uh, surely you must be the Queen of Heaven, that is, Mary. And she says, no, I'm not the Queen of Heaven, I'm the Queen of Fairyland. <laughs> and she says, and if you kiss me, then you must serve me. And so he kisses her, of course, like an idiot. And um, he, he gets up, uh, he's, uh, he, he has to get up on the horse behind her, and they, they, they ride off into, through very strange countries indeed. And they ride through a place where all the blood of all the dead runs runs across in a, as a, a, in a river, and they ride to a place where there are, where three paths separate from their path, and there's one steep and rocky path that goes up to to heaven, and then there's a well trodden broad path that leads down into hell. But in between them, there's a third path, which is a bonny path that winds about the Ferny Bray. Round winds about the ferny valley. That is the path to fair, uh, uh, fair Elfland, uh, where thou and I this night must mourn gay, where we must go this night. So, um, in other words, there's a kind of third way, a third sort of uh, you know. <coughs> something that is not either heaven or hell, it's not purgatory either, it's something else, it's the world of the imagination, you could say. And um, so what is going on with, um, uh, the time brings us the audience over 16 years, 
okay, is able to do this mysterious fairyland thing, okay, because of our, uh, because of our imagination. In that time, the, the effects of this horrible tragedy are overwhelmed by the fact that these, these children grow up and fall in love. That in some way this capacity for imagination is also related to the, to the slow, crea- slow time of, uh, of, of growth and reproduction and babies and, and all of that, right? It's slow time. <laughs> he, you know, he, he's able to let us see the slow time by jumping over all that time and looking at the, looking at what happens in the gap. And I'm not putting it very clearly, but you know, great question. Um, any other any other questions? Oh, you have to keep this man talking. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, I thought I was being really difficult. <laughs> so, uh, thank you. Yeah. That was this is just for Paul, but um, do you um, in looking at the talk you just gave, yeah. is there any kind of incommensurability between uh, time being performed and and uh, uh, projected uh, in literature? And the, the philosophical commentary that you were bringing to bear on it—is there any kind of incommensurability between those two things? Do you see them as being parallel or <coughs> intersecting? Or yeah, um, let me put it this way: I, I think what is there's a long tradition of time as a line. Right? And it's there in the calendar. It's just, you know, it just goes back and forth like, like a text, all right? But it's a line. And it's there on the clock, except that the line joins itself up here yeah, at, at the end, you know, the sort of snake swallows its tail. But it's still the idea of a line. Um, and maybe that's. And you know, once you've got a line, you can then make it into the t-axis of a graph and do all of calculus and do all kinds of wonderful scientific predictions and, and foretell eclipses and, and what have you. You can do all of that stuff. But the trouble is that, that that persuades one that time is something like space. <coughs> and it's not. I mean, maybe it was like space at the first microsecond of the Big Bang, but since then it's turned into something very, very different indeed. It's a, you could say it's a space dimension that went completely mad and completely wild. It was, a, you know, it was the infinite improbability drive. You know. <laughs> and it produced more and more infinite improbability. I mean, the probability against us all being here together doing this is absolutely staggering. I mean, it can't possibly be true. You know, so, uh, what, I'm, what, I, what Shakespeare is doing, and what I've been trying to do all my life, I think, is to try to find alternative metaphors for time, or alternative ways of talking about time. <coughs> and, uh, but, but, the, but the interesting thing is that some of those ways of talking about time, are, uh, we're almost being forced into by cosmological physics. That we, you know, we've identified a distinct, some distinct places where the laws of physics do not apply. You know, and some of the cosmologists are saying, you know, that uh, that that, that uh, uh, even saying that we are simply the surface of a singularity. I mean, and uh, Julius Fraser says that out of the atemporality of in which time is like space, so to speak, of the first moment, that, that, that time itself evolved into this strange thing which has, you know, earlier and later and before and after and eventually generates a present tense uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, all the, and then all the branching time that is implied by the decisions that animals and human beings make. And so, looking for a different metaphor. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm just going to, I don't want to follow up. Stephen's really kind of helped me think something through, which is what's devastating about A Winter's Tale for me is actually the difference between time and art and time in the theatre and time. Like, it seems that what you're interested in doing is, is showing how A Winter's Tale gives us really great insight into the complexity of lived time, human time. And for me, when I, the, I thought it was brilliant what you said. I had never thought that the first act is actually all the, the tragedies piled in. I've always read it as like, wow, look at it. It's like Othello on speed, right? It's like, let's speed up Othello. It's really, but, but, but it's a, it's a, it's a. But there's betrayal as in Macbeth. You no, know, I, I get it now, but, 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 but it's a time, but, no, but it's a, in effect, he's actually telling us, look what, look what art can do. Yeah. We can speed up time. I can make it go real fast. I can jump over stuff. Yeah. And then actually art can also make the dead come back to life. Yeah. But all those things to just say, that happens. And the reason why we weep in a winter's tale is that happens in the world of art. But it doesn't happen in the world of life. I, I, like, I think that's the way I read it. I find that's why it's a very... And, and, that, and that's that, because this is, this time this, and art and time yeah. and life are not commensurable. And you I, actually learn about time and life by looking at how different time can be in art. That applies, I think, to the sonnets. And you know, when I first did my study 50 years ago of the winter's tale, I was thinking still in that notion of, you know... Uh, Art defeats time, you know, how with this rage or beauty, well, that, that's the wrong line, but you know, so long as men may breathe or eyes may see, so long lives this and this gives life to thee, and all of that, that art defeats time. But here in I wasn't making that scale, argument, I think the, uh, 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 Shakespeare realizes that in fact uh, the growthiness of time, you might say, is simply the same thing as art. That, 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 uh, human uh, uh, arting, human uh, poetry is just very fast evolution, very fast natural creativity, that they are not opposites, but they're the same thing. And so I, I think that Shakespeare changes his mind here. I'm and, going to invite yeah. into one last question, which is a different version of but it comes out of conversations mm. that we, we've just been having, mm. and uh, you're reading from Apocalypse, and my other class is that. So, um, part of the slow time mm. that you read, mm. part of the slow LMU development forum, is that attempt to take the time. Mm. But it's really a grounding in the present in which you actually make a kind of time by doing so. And uh, last Friday, we had our first common meeting of all the classes. And Brad Stone did an absolutely beautiful exposition of Seneca on this mm -hmm. question mm -hmm. of the ability that we don't actually not have enough time. We just don't use it properly. <laughs> so I'm thinking of our present moment. Mm. And the uh, that anxiety produced by the speed that we feel and the constant influx of mm. information mm. and stimuli mm. at the very moment that we have the anxiety of the ecological longer term temporalities mm. coming to some mm. kind of singularity, mm. and mm. so we experience time as a scarcity, as a thing that we don't yeah. have, yeah. and we experience the fear of scarcity of resources, mm. the fear of things running out, of not mm. having yeah. enough time. Yeah. And I'd like you to sort of unpack a relationship between slow time, which would be the equivalent of the time of art in that question, but from that view, how do you flip scarcity into abundance, mm. which is really what mm. we talked about through mm. Seneca. Mm. Mm. Well, uh, this, is, this is right where uh, I am at the moment. I mean, um, as I said, I mean, to, to, to talk about the physics of it, you know, if we're made of information, and if information it doesn't die. And we're, we're throwing off at every moment inform, enough information to 
theoretically to reconstitute us at every moment. We're throwing off a perfect photograph of everything that we are, and fly, it, it flies off into space. The, 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 the universe is full of flying information, you know, that, that there's in, in this immense abundance of it. You know, it's an entirely different, entirely different notion. But I, and uh, uh, it, 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 now obviously that you know it's very hard to catch the moment as it flies, you know, as, as, as Blake says. But it's sort of out there. Um, it, it's it's not lost. It, it's it's and the past. It seems to me more and more has not passed. It's it's all still there. Uh, it's it's just that we've. I mean, one metaphor that I like is the idea that the the, the past is like you know the 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 ground under in a forest that it's made of all the trees that that fell and 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 uh, and, de and decayed that but that it and got pressed down and got covered up by other stuff but it's all still it's all still down there. Um, uh, it, or, is, is, or is this a, a, a vain hope? Um, but it doesn't feel that way to me. And maybe, and you know, maybe I'm just getting old, and, and in some ways, I'm beginning to get sort of fairly sanguine about everything. Uh, I don't need to rush about and change everything. It's all working itself out, you know. <laughs> it's it's coming along, you know. It's cool. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and, and you turned into a California. <laughs> <laughs> you you were in Oxford and now you're here. I'm I'm just picking up those good vibrations. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, I, it's it's not. It, I mean, it's not that I don't. That I you know, of course, I I have you know, being a poet, I've got this you know pressure to to create and to speak and so on. Um, but uh, you know, you can you can take that as a kind of anxiety, or you can take it as something you know. Uh, it's uh, don't worry about it. It's going to come out. It's like you know, it's like worrying about the you know the cat up up up, up the tree. You don't need to send for the fire brigade. Have you ever seen a cat skeleton in a tree? You know, <laughs> you know the, the cat is going to come down. You know? <laughs> The poem's gonna get written. You know? <laughs> I think that is a beautiful affirmative note. <laughs> and, uh, I'm going to ask John Jackson to transition us uh, to the next stage. And as he does so, looking around, I just want to reiterate my gratitude to everyone who I see. Uh, who works in this library and who's been so hospitable to the forum so far, and it's a joy to be here for the opening of it. John. Oh, and I wanted to say thank you for your beautiful campus. Thank you for your beautiful presence. Uh, I, I, I love this place. I'm thinking of, of uh, you know, shaving my beard and dyeing my hair and enrolling as a friend. <laughs> Thank you so much, um, and thank everyone for coming here. We're now going to move to the second portion of this evening. Um, I know, personally, my mind is awash in metaphors and references to Darwin and Douglas Adams and Beach Boys and Shakespeare, and I would really love to continue this conversation, and I hope that you also will, dare I say it, exit pursued by bearish conversation <laughs> in the atrium and enjoy some food and wine. Thank you all for coming.